You know, here on the Russell Moore Show, one of the things that we do from time to time is tell me where I'm wrong, uh, where I talk to someone who would disagree with me on something. And the rules of the game are that I'm uh, not allowed to argue. I'm just allowed to ask questions to get better insight. And so the the next uh, guest that we're going to be talking to in a few minutes, Rain Wilson, Dwight Schrute from The Office, who's written this uh, new book on spirituality, we would see things very differently. He he sees spirituality in a much more uh, general sense, where I, as an evangelical Christian, uh, have a very specific and objective uh, view of Jesus Christ. But I think we have a good and, and respectful uh, conversation. We did both on the air and off the air. One of the things that I had to really, really keep myself from doing was making constant office quotations and uh, and uh, puns. So I have someone who says uh, that I'm only five or six seconds away from a Bible quotation or an office uh, citation in any conversation. So I'm trying not to do that. So let's listen to the conversation with Rain Wilson. Rain Wilson, three-time Emmy-nominated actor, the founder of Soul Pancake, uh, has a uh, show, Rain Wilson and the Geography of Bliss, on Peacock. And the author of the new book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. Rain Wilson, thanks for being on The Russell Moore Show. Hey, thanks for having me. I'll say in reading this, there, there, there wasn't a lot of Battlestar Galactica, but there was a lot of Star Trek here uh, <laughs> references. And so I, I'm wondering how Dwight Schrute and anti-Dwight Schrute are you in real life? Uh, there's a lot of similarities. Um, I'm a little bit socially awkward. Um, I um, have a sense of kind of right and wrong, and um, I can be kind of a jerk sometimes. Uh, so those are some ways that we intersect. We certainly are both big Battlestar Galactica fans, um, although, like you said, I, I reference Star Trek a lot more because I think there is some spiritual benefit to the investigation of, of Star Trek. But I think that the main thing about Dwight is his world is, and his world vision is pretty small, right? So he's all about hierarchies. Um, who's got power, who's in charge. He's very clannish. It's very about, um, who's a shrewd and who's not. And in Dunder Mifflin, you know, who has, um, uh, kind of a, social capital over others. So he mm -hmm. can be a bully. He can be a nerd. Um, he can, uh, be a toady. Uh, and I would say that I hope that rain Wilson has a little bit more, uh, uh, wide ranging spiritual maturity and mm -hmm. is, uh, able to, uh, loving, lovingly embrace, uh, people that are different than him, uh, in a more holistic way. You you mention a, a quite a few times, several times in the book Soul Boom, uh, sort of explaining why you're talking about religion for people who will be turned away by that. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering when you think about in popular culture uh, right right now, uh, usually when religion is depicted, it's either in a cheesy sort of almost propaganda ish way done by mm -hmm. religious people or in, in more mainstream pop culture, the religious person is usually the villain. Uh, and religion is almost always presented in a, in a dark manner. Do you think that that's more because of a, a distance from culture makers and religious life or, or is this just the moment we're in right now? Uh, that's a great question. And, you might be referring to, maybe you're not, but I had a tweet that got a lot of uh, heat about a month or two ago where I was watching this wonderful show on HBO called The Last of Us about this post-apocalyptic survivors trying to make it on planet Earth. And it's pretty exciting and well done, well acted. And one of the episodes started and it started with a pastor reading to his congregation from the book of Revelation. And... um and immediately, I mean, half second in, I'm like, oh, he's evil. 
And it turns out not only was he evil, he was a pedophile cannibal, like as evil as you could make a human being, they made this guy. And my first thought was like, that's just lazy writing. It's just, it's lazy. I've seen it a thousand times where it's like, because everyone likes a good hypocrite as a villain and it's the easiest kind of, you know, uh, storytelling to have like someone pretending to be spiritual, a spiritual leader, and they actually have this, you know, dark underbelly. And, uh, and, and I think that, um, Hollywood unfairly, um, uh, victimizes Christians and believers. You so rarely, if ever see just a reasonable, kind, loving person of faith who, by the way, I have tons of Christian friends. I love them so dearly. I learn from them so dearly. And they are kind people that want to make the world a better place. They love Jesus and they want to be of service and emulate Jesus's way toward the poor and the downtrodden. And they want to build community in there. They, they want to create diverse, loving communities. And that's so rarely pictured. Um, mm. And... Uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll I'll leave it at that. Yeah, probably the the most, probably the kindest depiction that I can think of in recent years would be Ned Flanders on The Simpsons. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Although he was, you know, Ned Flanders was the butt of jokes for the first like, right. twenty years of the show, and then they kind of were like, "Hey, wait a minute, maybe Ned Flanders could have some better qualities." And then they started to have episodes. It was only after decades that they kind of like revealed other sides of Ned and like. Oh, maybe Ned knows something that Homer doesn't, and and the Simpsons might be able to learn something from those Flanders. <laughs> yes, you mentioned in the book about uh, religion right now being almost focused on sports and celebrity, in terms of the way that we find a kind of uh, spirituality. And you also talked about your grappling with addictions, maybe not, uh, maybe not addictions, but a pull toward certain kinds of addictions. I wonder if was celebrity, has that been an addiction you've had to avoid? I went through a lot of dark times in my twenties and early thirties when I had left the religion of my childhood, which is the Baha'i faith. And, uh, being raised Baha'i, I was raised to appreciate all faiths, to love the Bible, to study the Bible, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, the writings of the Buddha. This is inherent. This is in the DNA of being a Baha'i. So conversations about deep spiritual topics, about the meaning of life and the nature of God and of the soul and the spiritual journeys that we all make on in this human physical realm. Um, when I jettisoned all that in my 20s, and I did deal with addiction issues, and I dealt with anxiety and depression and a lot of mental health stuff, um, I, I, I had a deep hunger to dig into spiritual topics and ideas. Um, I want to quote the great writer Julia Cameron, who wrote that wonderful text called The Artist's Way. And she said, I come to spirituality not out of virtue, but out of necessity. And for me, I'm so grateful for those dark times that I underwent in my 20s because it set me on a spiritual path to kind of figure out who God was and what it was what it was to believe in God and what it was to have a spiritual life um, and what the meaning of life might be. And again, this doesn't make me wise. It doesn't make me a guru or arrived or some kind of like exemplar, not at all. I just did a lot of digging and a lot of reading and I read the Bible and I read the Bhagavad Gita and I read the Torah and the, the, you know, I read the, you know, Dhammapadas of the Buddha and Sikh works and Sufi texts and, um, eventually came back around to the faith of my childhood. But, uh, I, I truly believe that this religious quest, uh, is, uh, has enriched my life and made it better, has given me balance, has brought me uh, a, a return to reason and, and sanity and, and wisdom. And going to your question about fame, yeah, so, you know, I need to use spiritual tools on a 
daily basis to balance myself because I'm such a anxious person and uh, prone to, you know, addiction, depression, and other issues. So my daily prayer and meditation practice is to um, is to balance me so that I'm just functional, Russell. It doesn't make me super wise or anything like that. I can just helps me get through my day better. Mm-hmm. But you're, you're, fame is, is a tricky beast. It really is. So for me, as this insecure, anxious guy, my mom took off when I was a year and a half. I lived with my dad. We were very poor. Uh, I had a stepmom and they were in a very unhappy marriage. And, you know, we had a lot of good things about my childhood, but we all, I had a lot of trauma as well. Um, I, uh, all of a sudden, and after working as an actor for like 14 or 15 years, all of a sudden I had a certain measure of fame. Um, so I had gotten out of theater school. I'd done a bunch of theater and then plugged away in little TV shows and movies. And then all of a sudden I was getting recognized from the office and some other movies and TV shows that I did around that time. And all of a sudden people are stopping me and going, I love you. Can you imagine that walking down the street and people grabbing you, like literally grabbing you, looking in your eyes and going, I love you. And you're just like, and here's this love starved little kid inside of me with all of a sudden getting this adulation. And it, it was fascinating because I spent many years early on in the office craving more, like it wasn't enough. And I talked recently to the other actor on the show, BJ Novak, about this. And we we talked about the fact that our biggest regret from the office is that we just didn't enjoy it more. Like mm. after being a starving actor for decades, and then all of a sudden having a show that was winning awards, I was making a lot of money. They were wonderful, beautiful people that I was um, acting with. And uh, people really adored the show. Like, let that be enough. But instead I was like, but I want movies. I want to be, how come I'm not a movie star? Like Will Ferrell and Jack Black and, and, and Seth Rogen, like, and, and I need more, I've got to line this up and I've got to get this deal at this studio. And why didn't they buy my script? And, and why didn't they take my pitch? And I want a first look deal at Warner brothers. And, you know, so it's, it's never enough, you know, and that is one of the great spiritual conundrums, isn't it? That we have enough and yet it's never enough. It's like the Buddha describes life is suffering, you know, which is the, the term he used was dukkha and the Pali means uh, kind of chronic dis- anxious dissatisfaction and, and a feeling a lack of, and that hunger, the hungry ghost that wants more kind of spent several years running the show. I'm one of the few actors in Hollywood talking about God, the soul, religion, spirituality, and and frankly, I'm getting it from both sides. You know, mm-hmm. I'm getting it from the Christian right that is like, wait a minute, he's a Baha'i. Mm-hmm. That's the devil's religion, and he's going to hell, and that's a false prophet, and uh, et cetera. And I'm getting it from the political left, which is like, he's talking about morality. There's no such thing as morality. And oh, God, and the whole problem with the world is religion and God and morality. And, you know, so I'm, I'm, happily getting it from both sides. And I, I actually enjoy being in that position because Russell, I've done a whole bunch of therapy and I don't really care what people think about me anymore. (laughs) And it's such a beautiful release to be in my, shall I generously say mid fifties and not caring what people think by and large. You know, one of the things that you talk about in the book that few people do, or at least in in detail, is death. Uh, Mm -hmm. I was especially interested in the section about uh, the death of your dad, maybe because Mm -hmm. I lost my dad uh, three years ago. And that's a that's a shock to anyone's system, I think. And it doesn't matter how old one's father is when that happens. I'm wondering, what do you think happens to someone when he or she dies? I mean, what is that transcendent? What that transcendence? What is that next step in your opinion? Um, I love it. You're just going right to the point. Like, here we go. <laughs> okay. I love it. The biggest, deepest possible question that humanity <laughs> has wrestled with for hundreds of thousands of years. 
by the way, speaking of humanity having wrestled with this for hundreds of thousands of years, that is the earliest evidence that humanity has always had some kind of spiritual belief system is because humans and the oldest graves that we have found have been buried with things that they will need on a journey. So the oldest grave sites, the oldest human habitations have kings or elders buried with swords, with weapons, with sleds, with their trusty dogs by their sides, by with, you know, backpacks or little, you know, cases with books, arrowheads, etc. So humanity has always had this idea that we are on a journey that uh, doesn't end at the end of our physical life on this physical plane. So the best way that I can explain this is through a metaphor that's used in the Baha'i writings, which I love, and I bring it up in the book, and that has to do with the baby in the womb. So the baby in the womb is growing everything it needs for this world. It's growing eyelashes and eyelids and ears and elbows and fingers and everything you can possibly think of to, um, to function on this physical plane. If you went to a baby and you interviewed it and you said, Hey, why are you growing eyes and ears? The baby would be like, I have no idea. I'm perfectly happy here in this sack hanging out. I'm being fed. It's nice and warm. I'm happy. I'm comfortable. I don't know what I need. Why is all this stuff growing out of my body? Um, but thank God that we have grown those organs for functionality in the physical world. We are doing the same thing on this physical plane. We are growing eyes and ears and elbows. They're not physical. They're spiritual. This is what we take with us. We don't take with us our bodies. We don't take with us our, our Toyotas. <laughs> you know, we don't take with us our stuff. We take with us the qualities of the divine that we grow and develop and nurture in our hearts and in our actions over the course of our lives. So kindness, compassion, love, uh, patience, creativity, uh, light, all of the stuff that we grow and develop over the course of our lives are what we take with us. So part of our reason for existing, not all, part is to develop the spiritual qualities of God, best exemplified by God's Son, Jesus Christ, by God's messenger, Muhammad, by the friend of God, Moses, by the awakened one, the Buddha, uh, by the glory of God, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith. So in the Baha'i concept, there's no heaven and hell. Uh, it's a little bit different than some other faith traditions. Well, um, what, what, why would that be, though? Because if, if sort of the longings for love and transcendence, if that, if that points us to something, does the longing for justice uh, also point to a kind of accounting, a kind of judgment day? How, how, how does that uh, work itself out in the way you see Certainly. the future? Um, Baha'u'llah says, bring thyself to account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning because death unannounced shall soon visit you and you will be called to account for your actions. So is there a judgment day in that sense in the, in the Baha'i tradition, which I ascribe to? Absolutely. You Russell, me rain. We will be called in front of the mighty throne, humbled and on our knees and the entirety of our lives will be called in front of us and we will be will be responsible for the choices that we make. I, I truly believe that. Do those who have fallen short, are they punished for eternity in a fiery pit? Um, I don't get with that, nor do America's young people, uh, nor does most of the world. And that's where it's a little bit different. Like, I think that, however, I will say that separation from the divine distance from the divine is its own fiery pit. So if one hasn't developed those spiritual qualities, you are, you are, and you are distant from God or, or Godishness, spiritual, spiritualishness, then that is a kind of hell. And I've lived in a kind of hell and I've been in a hell of separation from the divine and I've been miserable and I have been suicidal 
And I have been, you know, the, uh, the son, the prodigal son, I've been the prodigal son, you know, and I have come back, uh, for mercy and for grace and forgiveness. So hell in a way to me works metaphorically, but heaven is the infinite other realms, uh, that await the glorious journey of the soul as we move forward from this physical world. Hmm. What well, you talk about in uh, soul boom about, uh, sort of the crisis of institutions, including uh, organized religious uh, institutions. And you say, why don't we make up our own uh, religion? Uh, and you, you have uh, quite a, a, a section on laying out uh, what that new religion would look like. Um, and I'm just wondering, as I read that, because I think you are you are so right on so many of the diagnoses of, of what's uh, happening. But when it comes to making up one's own religion, how is that not kind of um, recyclops? You know, uh, you're, you're, <laughs> you, 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 you're kind of putting together a, a metaphor uh, in a way that it would seem to me in order to in order for spirituality to actually bring about the goods that you talk about, it, there would have to be something objectively true. Does does it does it seem that it might be sort of trivializing of uh, of religious claims. I mean, the the, the difference yeah. between uh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the the way, the truth, and the life, as I do, and and a Muslim friend who would completely reject uh, incarnation, and so forth. Those would be really big differences for both of us, not just kind of a generic uh, spirituality. So how do you how do you think about about that, about about whether or not this is just one more form of kind of an expressive individualism? Yes, that's a great question. And you're 100% right. Making up a religion does trivialize the truth of the world's great faith traditions. And that's why I hope I had enough tongue in cheek throughout that section <laughs> to call it soul boom, trademark the religion. Um, and my purpose in writing that chapter was not, in fact, to create any new religion, and that's made pretty clear in the chapter, mm -hmm. but to get young people who have dismissed religion entirely and whole cloth to reconsider the amazing brilliance of organized religion. I talk in great length in the book about uh, one of my favorite chapters in human history, and one of the most progressive, which is the early centuries of the Christian church. Mm -hmm. Never before in the history of humanity, and a lot of Christians don't know this. I'm astonished that they don't, but never before in the history of humanity had a more diverse group of people gathered and been welcomed, loved, and accepted than those early centuries of the church, where a church service would include a Phoenician sailor, a Roman gladiator, a a Jewish theologian, a former slave, a former prostitute, and they would all be gathered acknowledging Jesus as the as the Son and the Lord as the Father, seeking grace, you know, reading the the letters of Paul and praying, singing, worshiping together and and all being accepted. That had never happened before in human history. Everything was tribal. And not only that, not only that, these early Christians sacrificed their time, their energy, their comfort, and their material wealth in service of others who weren't in their tribe. Mm -hmm. All those people would gather, and they would go find a sick family of Samaritans, and they would give them food, and they would give them comfort and clothing. And the Romans wrote about it. They were like, what is up with these people? <laughs> they are serving others that aren't even the members of their tribe or family or race. What the hell is going on out here? And that's one of the reasons I believe that early Christianity was seen as such a threat to empire. I hold in great esteem uh, the world's faith traditions and certainly my own faith tradition, which incorporates and includes the word, not necessarily Christian practice or theology or what have you, but the red letter words of Jesus but young people have rejected whole cloth religion in this modern age. And 
just now, just, I mean, literally the last five or 10 years, social scientists and, and positive psychologists are going, hey, wait a second. Religion actually holds a great deal of keys to mental health and well-being during this, you know, mental health epidemic. And uh, folks with faith, young folks with faith are actually doing better than young folks without it. And they're starting to look at the hard data around this. It seems often when people talk about the benefits that come with religion, it seems to me that sometimes kind of like saying placebos work, so let's all take placebos, <laughs> which means if you know this, if you know it's a placebo, it it doesn't work. And so the benefits of religion come with people who actually believe there's something objectively true there. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, that that there are things that are not. So, I mean, those those early Christian communities are coming around letters yep. of Paul, often that are saying, if if Christ is not raised, none of this matters. You you, you would be better off. Uh, you, you would be better off just uh, living your life and dying. Yeah, uh, they're not. It's real. not a rotary meeting. They're not yeah, getting right. together <laughs> just to kind of like hang out and have a potluck and share stories and good times and high five each other. There is a, a central belief, like I said, that they hang their hat on uh, at yeah. the center. But I kind of feel like, well, does it really matter how anyone comes to the father? Like start, come for the potlucks, stay for the salvation. How about that? You could put that on a Christian bumper sticker. <laughs> you know, whatever draws young people into, if they're looking for community, give them community and draw them in. And if they're looking for love, give them a loving community. And, you know, eventually they may be drawn to some higher uh, and more complex and real precepts. You, you have a section in the book where you talk about loneliness. I thought was really perceptive that the loneliness leads to a kind of scanning for threats. And that leads to anxiety. And the anxiety leads to more loneliness and the cycle uh, starts all over again. Uh, I mean, how, how, when you're dealing with uh, teenagers right now, often who are in a, a state of heightened anxiety, everybody coming out of, of COVID, I mean, is there, is there a way as a society that we can get out of that? loop. I mean, it's kind of, I was just talking to someone uh, earlier today about a group of people who it seemed to me the first question they asked themselves about anything is how am I being slighted by this? Which means you're always going to find slights uh, there. And so these people were making a miserable workplace for themselves by having that, that mentality. How do we get out of that? You're asking me how to heal the mental health epidemic that <laughs> is the number one killer of young people right. in Western society as suicide has become the number one mm -hmm. uh, cause of death for young folks. I believe, Russell, that there are tools in this great faith traditions, all of them, that can help us and not can help us, that will help us and that we need. Humanity desperately needs these tools and these ideas um, to find uh, peace, meaning, tranquility, and, uh, and purpose. And again, I'll use the phrase we, we've, just as I did when I was younger, I threw the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater. When I rejected my, the faith of my childhood, um, I also jettisoned all the spiritual tools that are available. So my book, I hope, works on lots of different levels, and I hope that atheists enjoy it, and I hope that born-again Christians enjoy it, because it's just having spiritual conversations, like you said, about death, about the soul, about the nature of life and suffering. Um, in fact, let's go to suffering. Hmm. Part of the problem with contemporary American society is that parents have tried to take suffering away from their children. One of the, um, Abdul Baha, the son of the founder of Baha'u'llah, who's a great spiritual teacher in the Baha'i tradition, he said very little about education of children. But one of the things he said about education of children is, let, is he said, allow your children to become accustomed to hardship. And when you think about that in the context of contemporary civilization, where we try and take away all of the bruised 
elbows and skinned knees from our kids and we try and give them every comfort, right? They call this affluenza mm -hmm. and we try and take away any and like, oh, you have a conflict or, oh, we'll put that out. Oh, this is difficult for you. Oh, let us, you know, helicopter parents kind of like um, taking away these problems and these difficulties. Then, and also we're not having conversations about suffering. I, I quote, I don't have it on the tip of my tongue, but it's in my book somewhere. I think there's a great quote by the apostle Paul about suffering saying, you know, I am, I am glad for your suffering because it creates spiritual growth. Uh, do you happen to know it off yes, the top of your head? Romans five endurance and endurance, uh, produces hope and hope does not put us to shame. Um, that's great. And, uh, so for, for me, because we're not talking about the nature of suffering, suffering grows our souls. We're in these soul growing machines called human bodies. And we become grateful eventually for the suffering that we've undergone because it can be transformative. Um, and why is there suffering? But suffering's part of the game. The Buddha says, I come for one reason and one reason only suffering and the elimination of suffering. And that idea that um, suffering is a constant and an important part of life and that it's real and it's ultimately as hard as it appeals is to swallow, it's ultimately for our benefit and it's a mystery of God. So the reason I'm lecturing right now on suffering is because if we're not raising our children to kind of understand suffering, through a spiritual lens, then they're not going to gain resilience. And resilience is one of the things that psychologists uh, write about that the younger generations are lacking, is a, is a kind of emotional resilience to, to obstacles and to difficulties. Hmm. And so, again, we have thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater as we've rejected culturally religion we're then also throwing out a conversation about the nature of suffering and our children are truly suffering because we're not talking to them about suffering. Mm. You, you talk in the book, it was moving to me about uh, your dad and your stepmom divorced right after you got out of high school and left. I, I want, I, it seems to me there are a lot of kids who are in that state of just insecurity. They don't know what's going to happen next. What would you say to that 15 year old, uh, who's out there who says, I think, I think my parents are about to divorce. I think my entire life is about to be uprooted and we're, we're going to have to move. What should I do? Yeah. Divorce is a, uh, that's a tough one. You know, what do you do when 50, 60% of marriages end in divorce? Um, I, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had some wisdom around that. Um, I think that, uh, um, you know, I would say, you know, that old hippie bumper sticker, let there be peace in the world and let it begin with me. Like mm -hmm. you grow, we want to develop world peace, you know, which is something that when I was growing up in the seventies and eighties, people actually talked about world peace. They kind of were like, they wish they longed for world peace beauty contestants, <laughs> mm -hmm. scientists, philosophers, scholars, politicians talked about world peace. We thought it was possible. Um, I guess I'm digressing a little bit because I don't have a good answer. So I'm just flapping a bunch <laughs> of hot air, but I'm going to say that I'm going to say that the family peace starts with the family and grows from there. So it, it's super important work that, um, I think for, for folks that are a product of divorce, to undertake a deep curiosity about maybe why their parents divorced and what the mistakes they might have made, and to envision what a a loving uh, monogamous relationship would look like, um, and uh, and and seek to have that in their lives. You know, learn 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 your parents' lesson uh, so you can apply it to your own life. That's the only thing I got on that, but I, I wish I had a a better answer. But it's a super important topic. Right before uh, we started recording, my two of my sons were here, wanted to be here to see you. They've never asked to be here for <laughs> any other it's recording. because you have such boring guests, Russell. I, yes, that's right. That's Always. right. That's right. But they 
there, there's an entire generation. I mean, The Office isn't like Three's Company or uh, uh, even <laughs> All in the Family or, or or one of these sitcoms. It lives, especially with Gen Z, millennials, the, the those who are below Gen Z coming up, who often are watching it on a loop all the time. Mm. And there was uh, – someone had written about how odd it is that there's an escapist fantasy about working at a paper company in, <laughs> in Scranton, Pennsylvania. But it does seem to be comforting in in some way to – in entirely new generations of people. Why do you suppose that is? Well, people have been asking me on my book tour about spirituality as it relates to the office. And I will say this, that at its heart, um, the very last line that's said by Pam, the very last line of the episode is, is I, I, I'm, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but it's, it's about like, there's beauty in the ordinary is, and isn't that what it's all about? And that's how the show ends and the beauty in ordinary things. And I think that 90% of the office, 93% of the office is just silliness, but 7% of it is about real human connection. It's about family. It's about people coming together and finding the beauty in the ordinary things. So I think that's what, that magic recipe that Greg Daniels, our showrunner, you know, sprinkled in his magic Hollywood fairy dust over the show that keeps people coming back time and time again to uh, enjoy those characters. And but it is it's pretty preposterous that I've run into a lot of young people and they're like, I want to get a job just like a Dunder Mifflin. Like they think like working in an office, which can be soul sucking drudgery. Believe me, I did it for years. Um, is kind of has that kind of the, the warmth and heart and zaniness of, of working at Dunder Mifflin. But I'm, listen, this, this leads to another topic, which is, uh, in the Baha'i faith, we're taught that work in the spirit of service is worship in the eyes of God. So working working in service to others is a form of worship, just like prayer. And although I didn't go into the office, none of us went to make the office to uh, be of service, it's been a wonderful byproduct that the show has brought so much solace and hope and joy to people during really hard times. And I hear that every day from folks like the show means so much to me. Thank you for making it. Um, it, you know, my brought my siblings together when my parents were getting a divorce, uh, we would sit around and watch it when my aunt had cancer and, you know, um, I'm honored and blessed to be a part of a show that was able to bring some warmth and solace into people's lives. Hmm. Well, it strikes me that one of the reasons uh, that you talk about in the book, one of the reasons you wrote the book is because there, there, there is a danger of, I don't think you use the, the word cynicism, but there is a danger of cynicism and numbness and, and hardening. And I thought, I thought about institutions when I actually, I came across a quote that Aaron Schur gave about the debate over whether or not Dwight or Andy should be manager after Steve huh. Carell left. Okay. And what he said was it, it was, he was afraid that if Dwight was empowered as the boss, that it would be scary. He said, it, it's funny if he sets the office on fire and blow torches all the doorknobs, but if he did that all day long without any sort of check on his behavior, it would be terrifying. <laughs> and as I read that, I thought, you know, it's almost a metaphor for why we have so much cynicism uh, right now. It seems as though the whole world actually is being run by Dwight Schrute, that, the, that there are people who don't <laughs> seem to know how to uh, how to actually lead through this. And it's it can be scary. Well, this is one of the theses. Is that a word? Theses? I don't theses, mean theses. Sure. Yeah. Theses of the book, which I talk about the spiritual revolution aspect, which is transforming uh, systems along spiritual lines. 
So many of our systems are broken and breaking down and are unsustainable because the systems themselves are based on the very worst qualities of humanity. They're based on competition and contest and every man for himself and one-upsmanship and uh, survival of the fittest and, um, and not on community consultation, love, common service, and cooperation. The other elements of humanity that have, you know, created the world's great religions and, and, um, and systems that actually work with this toxic system of partisanship that we have in the country where you have these two, uh, competing like rabid football teams. It's like when, you know, B Cleveland Browns and fans and, and Pittsburgh Steeler fans get together and they're like, ah, or Philadelphia Eagle fans or whatever. Um, and they loathe and they contemptuously hate the other party and seek to destroy it and seek as much power for themselves as, as possible. There couldn't be anything more unbiblical than uh, the American partisan politi political system, which I talk about in great length in the book. And uh, as someone who has really voted independently along both party lines for my entire life, I feel like um, in a sense that you're talking about Dwight being the manager and you know setting fire to the house. Our American political system itself uh, is is very much in in line with that and rewarding kind of some of the worst aspects of humanity. People talk a lot about like, well, we should elect the person from this party and then everything would be better. But people are never having a conversation about like, wait a minute, what if the system is not right? What if the system is is rigged wrong and can we reimagine it to be something much more in line with uh spiritual principles and with love hmm. we, we started out uh, talking about uh, for, for a little bit my own evangelical christian uh community uh has has something of a reputation problem for all kinds of reasons earned and, and unearned um there i wonder when you look from the outside uh what would it take to convince you that historic Christianity is true? And I, I guess when I'm asking that, what I'm really asking is, uh, what what would it take for you to change uh, and to be persuaded? Or would you say, I really I've I've investigated everything, and I'm I'm pretty certain about where I am now. Yeah, um, great. What would it take for you to become a Baha'i? What would it take for you yeah. to believe that Jesus's return is not going to be on a cloud with trumpets, but no. is actually going to be the return of the spirit of Jesus Christ um, uh, that returns in some other way? You know, it's it's an interesting question. What, you know, and it's one of the reasons why Christians have uh, throughout history been very unsuccessful in converting Muslims is because Muslims include the divinity of the Christ. They may not view Christ as like the son, as like God zapped a person with a body and kind of gave him that special station. But for me, um, I view myself as a Baha'i and a Christian. So I do love Jesus Christ with all of my heart and I love his example, I love his words. I don't necessarily get with the Nicene Creed or, you know, how things shook down in the, you know, the creation of the Catholic Church and then the Protestant Revolution and Martin Luther. Like, I, you know, all of that stuff, I don't pay that much attention to as a Baha'i. So I've already converted. Consider me converted in the sense that I love and adore Jesus Christ. And I do believe that the only way through the Father when he was alive was the, the way, the truth, and the light was through Jesus Christ. I 100% I believe that. And then I also believe that the way to the Father when Muhammad was, was alive was through the, the teachings of the, of the Holy Quran. And now I believe that Baha'u'llah is the newest incarnation of the light. I, and I feel like um, there's a beautiful quote in the Baha'i faith, like, don't fall in love with the lamp, fall in love with the light. And, um, and I think that that's, that's what Baha'is seek to do. But listen, here's the important thing. 
Um, I know there's a lot of Christians like tearing their hair out going, that's not right now. And that's (laughs) fine. But people are often angry at me and that's all right. I can handle it. I've had a lot of therapy, but I will say this. The important thing, Russell, is people of faith need to work together and stick together. And the world is in a terrible place. And the more that we selflessly serve for the benefit of all of humanity um, and work side by side, elbow to elbow, agnostics, spiritual but not religious, born again evangelicals, Muslims, Baha'is, Buddhists, that's what the world needs right now. So um, much more than any kind of conversion, and this soul boom is not a Baha'i book. I'm not trying to convert anyone to any way of thinking. I'm trying to convert people to a spiritual way of thinking. Um, that's what we need to do is all work together, find commonalities, uh, and love the example of Jesus serving the poor and, and work together and for transformation. Well, you, you said, what would it take for me to become Baha'i? It would be becoming convinced that Jesus is the lamp or a lamp rather than the light. But uh, I, I believe he he is the the light. Uh, but one of the things I'm, I really appreciate about this book is you're really honest and you're also respectful of, uh, uh, of people who wouldn't see things uh, this way. And I think having those kinds of conversations are what we're going to to need as a country together. The book is Soul Boom, Why We, Why we Need a Spiritual Revolution by Rain Wilson. Rain, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What a wonderful conversation. I, I, I didn't know what to expect, and this has just been joyous, and uh, it's, been a, it's been an honor to speak with you. Thanks so much. I thought that was a fascinating conversation. I thought the book was um, fascinating in terms of, as I, as I mentioned to Rain, I think he diagnoses a lot of the problems right in terms of breakdown of community, loneliness, where I'm not convinced is in this understanding of spirituality as something useful. Um, and I think he he would not say it quite that boiled down, but I, I think what he's saying is that basically underneath everything spiritual is the same thing, and we're all kind of getting at that from different directions. That's not what I think is the case. I think that Jesus is either dead or alive, and if he's alive, that means that um, that he was telling the truth uh, about himself. And so I'm not uh, I'm not on a track to Baha'ism anytime anytime soon. I told him off air that I really um, I liked uh, the metaphor that, that he used of the the baby in the womb, not knowing uh, why it is that that there are ears and eyes and hands. And I told him I hate to say that the first thing I thought of was Dwight Schrute. Uh, talking about his twin brother in the womb that he resorbed so that he had the strength of a full-grown man and a little baby. But once I put that out of my mind, I think even though we would see that metaphor a little bit differently, I think that's true, and I think that's right. Thanks for being with us. This is The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by Christianity Today. I have a new book coming out on August the 1st of this year. It's called Losing Our Religion, an Altar Call for Evangelical America. And really what this book is about is how to navigate the craziness that we're uh, all facing right now. How do we get to the point of uh, exhaustion that so many people are facing? Why why are so many people uh, leaving the church? Uh, Not because they can't believe what the church teaches, but because they don't believe the church believes what the church teaches. How can evangelical Christianity ever turn around? What would that look like and how do we get there? That's what this book is about. And you can uh, pre-order it in the show notes. And I look forward to sharing it with you August 1st. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. 
Executive producers are Eric Petrick, Russell Moore, and Mike Cosper. Hosted by Russell Moore. Produced by Ashley Hales. Associate producers, Abby Perry and Azurae Phelps. CT administration provided by Christine Kolb. Social media by Kate Lucky. Director of operations for CT Media is Matt Stevens. Production assistance provided by Core Media. Audio engineer is Kevin Duthu. Coordinator is Beth Grabencourt. Video producer is John Rowland. The theme song for The Russell Moore Show is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hutton. 